Previously, when we started our year, we learned that communication is a motivated transaction, that everything we communicate is some kind of argument, and that we are always communicating within a rhetorical situation, and that rhetorical techniques are what we use to navigate that rhetorical situation to achieve a specific purpose. Today, we're going to start talking about style, which is also an integral part of how we communicate. I like to think of it like this, that uh, arguments are what we communicate. Rhetoric, then, is how we communicate those arguments. Style, then, are the various embellishments we use to enhance how we communicate those arguments. Style, however, is not inherently persuasive. A metaphor or a parallel set of phrases mean absolutely nothing by themselves. They are not inherently persuasive or convincing. Style instead is used to enhance other persuasive elements in a text. When we analyze stylistic techniques or stylistic elements in a text, we must examine how they enhance one or more rhetorical techniques how they enhance the reasoning, character, and or emotional effects of a particular rhetorical technique. Think of style like a layer that sits on top of the rhetorical appeals within a text. The best way to study style is to break it down into the three ways it is used, into elements of word choice, elements of word arrangement, and elements of word sound. In this lesson, we will focus on analyzing elements of word choice. In our next lesson, we'll follow up with studying elements of word arrangement. And we're not really going to study word sound in this class. That's more the domain of literature, because really word sound only pertains to uh, literary writing, especially like poetry and drama and that sort of thing, which while we do read those things in this class, we don't really read them so much for their literary components. So we're not going to be studying word sound uh, as part of our AP language curriculum. When analyzing elements of word choice in a text, look for these four things. Meaningful words and phrases, imagery, word choice devices, and patterns of diction. Meaningful words and phrases are exactly what it sounds like. Words and phrases that communicate things beyond their literal meanings. Often uh, we look for unusual wording, ways that uh, wording can be kind of fresh or strange or different from what we would expect, or wording that's highly evocative of something. Words and phrases that evoke sensations, emotions, and our imaginations. For instance, John Muir, describing the conservation movement to preserve the sequoias as a, quote, righteous uprising, that is a meaningful uh, phrase there. It's highly evocative. It helps characterize this movement in a very particular way, and by extension, characterize the opposition to their movement. It works to emphasize Muir's emotional appeals and to a lesser extent, his character appeals as being uh, part of and a leader in uh, this particular movement. So what comes to mind when you think about the phrase righteous uprising? Well, to me, I think immediately of a religious crusade. I think of a group of people standing up and fighting tyranny. And a lot of that comes from where I've been raised. Uh, having been raised in the United States, uh, which was uh, born largely out of fighting a tyrannical uh, government in the British long ago. Um, and also the fact that our nation is predominantly a Christian uh, nation. That kind of brings to mind these sort of um, uh, biblical uh, connotations of the phrase. I think of uh, the Crusades uh, back in, uh, you know, the medieval times and whatever. And just in general, though, I think of like revolutions. I think of waving flags and leading a charge against some godless enemy, that sort of thing. Um, the reason that that comes to mind to a lot of us is, again, because of when and where we were raised here in American society. And that is exactly what John Muir is counting on. He is, after all, writing to an American audience, and he's counting on them to think of similar things.
So whenever you have trouble looking for or explaining meaningful word choice, I want you to consider the four dimensions of language. Yeah, all language uh, communicates on four distinct levels, and those are the intellectual, the sensuous, the emotional, and the imaginative dimensions. The intellectual dimension is just what the word or phrase literally means. It's the word or phrase's denotation. If you've learned denotation versus connotation, the intellectual dimension is the denotation, that word or phrase stripped of all connotative meaning. For instance, literally, the word righteous just means morally right or justifiable. That is what the word communicates on an intellectual, a purely intellectual level. Uprising means just any insurrection or revolt. The sensuous dimension is the physical sensations that the word or phrase evokes. This is part of the word's connotation. The various sensations of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch that accompany the word. And the uh, sensuous dimension of a word or phrase comes from our physical experience with the concept that that word or phrase communicates. So all of the things that uh, we've experienced growing up uh, firsthand or read about, that sort of thing, those physical experiences that we've had uh, with those concepts come to mind when we read those words. Uh, for example, when I see the word righteous, some of the senses that I experience are are heat, fire and brimstone, smoke, dust, uh, heat, fire and brimstone, because first of all, the very biblical connotation of righteousness, I think of God smiting people in hell and all that. Uh, and also, uh, you know, just uh, the smoke and dust, kind of the destruction that comes from that. When I think of the word uprising, I hear a tumult, a clashing of weapons and voices. Uh, I see blood and smell, kind of smoke, that sort of thing. So all of those are sensations that I experience when I read those two words. Next, the emotional dimension. This is another part of a word's connotation. It is the emotions that the word or phrase stirs. Think of all the various emotion words that we learned when we were learning uh, pathos appeals. And you always want to be very precise with your emotional definitions here. Uh, the emotional dimension of language comes from our emotional experiences with whatever concept is behind that word or phrase. For instance, when I think of the word righteous, uh, I feel the emotion of confidence. That's, that's kind of the emotion that comes with that. When I see the word uprising, I feel anger and enmity, that sort of thing. And again, this largely has to do with our experiences uh, with those words before. When I have felt righteous, it means I have felt so confident in myself that I felt like, you know, my my position was ordained by a higher power or something, <laughs> that sort of thing. So that's where these uh, these feelings come from. Lastly, the imaginative dimension is all the related concepts that the word or phrase conjures. So everything besides the physical sensations and the emotions, it's all the other you know, images and ideas and events and phenomenon that come to mind. And it comes from our imaginative experience with the word. Uh, every time we've read that word in a story, every time we uh, recall that word in some memory that we have, it carries with it that imaginative dimension. For instance, uh, the imaginative meanings of the word righteous, I think right away of, of the Bible, of God smiting people, of the Crusades, all of those kind of things from literature and from history uh, that are associated with that word. When I think of uprising, you know, I think of all kinds of revolutions throughout history, but of course, as an American, the first one that comes to mind is the American Revolution, which again, John Muir was counting on. All right, let's go ahead and pause this video to complete our first uh, part of the practice activity. In part A, you're going to be practicing identifying and explaining examples of meaningful words and phrases in the John Muir text. When you're done with the activity, go and unpause the video to continue the lesson. In addition to talking about meaningful words and phrases, you should also look for imagery, which is just the use of sensory language. Sensory language is language that evokes the physical sensations uh, of sight, sound, taste, smell, touch when we read them. Uh, it's image bearing language and it helps the reader experience things when they read. Yeah, sensory experience helps heighten our emotional and intellectual understanding of what's being talked about. 
There are five kinds of imagery traditionally based on the five traditional physical senses. Uh, sight imagery we call visual imagery. Things that we can hear, sounds, we call auditory imagery. Things that we smell, we call olfactory imagery. Taste, we call that gustatory imagery, which is kind of rare in literature outside of poetry. Uh, and lastly, touch sensations would be tactile imagery. Uh, by the way, we also call individual uses of imagery, we call those images. Now usually the term image immediately uh, you think of what you see but actually you can have auditory images and tactile images. Those are just individual uh, uses of tactile and auditory imagery. Be careful however that when you're analyzing imagery that you don't accidentally identify imagery that isn't there. This is something that I see year after year when I read uh, the rhetorical analysis uh, essay on the AP exam. Students love to talk about imagery, but they often do it when it's just not there. Imagery has to be concrete and specific. It has to be something that when everybody reads it, they see or hear or taste or smell or touch something concrete and specific. If it's just talking in abstract words, abstract wording doesn't communicate images. Abstractions are not image bearing. So even though you might be able to sense something when you read something abstract, it's purely arbitrary and it's just totally up to your brain. So that is not necessarily considered sensory language. All right. An example of imagery in John Muir's text, which by the way, there's not much imagery in here. Uh, he uses auditory imagery uh, about halfway through his text to describe the logging process that he was, he's observed. When he talks about how thousands of the finest sequoias have been felled, blasted into manageable dimensions and sawed into lumber by methods destructive almost beyond belief. Uh, by the way, when he talks about the, um, the sequoias being blasted into manageable dimensions, uh, I had to look this up, but they would actually use gunpowder uh, to uh, blow apart uh, or to help split the larger logs. And that's because their sawmills couldn't handle anything wider than 10 feet. And these sequoias, a lot of them are wider in diameter than 10 feet. And so they'd bore a hole into the center um, and they'd uh, put gunpowder in there and ignite it to blast it into quarters. Uh, and so that's what he's talking about there. So what do we hear when we read this and how does it make us feel? Well, right away, when we hear about the blasting of the trees into manageable dimensions, we think of the sounds that those explosives make and the sounds of the logs splintering and splitting. Uh, the saw blades being sawed in, you know, the saw, sawing the lumber, we think of the, uh, the, that whining sound, that really loud humming whining sound that a saw blade makes and the higher pitch it gets as it cuts through lumber, uh, you know, spraying the, uh, uh, you know, uh, sawdust all over the place. That kind of deafening noise in this place that should otherwise be very quiet right? Because this is a forest that they're cutting these down. They would set up these makeshift like lumber mill camps in these very secluded, serene places. So we get this feeling of chaos. It's almost kind of terrifying. Uh, whatever the opposite of feeling peaceful is, that's what I feel when I experience these sounds. Also, don't forget that imagery is often very complex and has many layers to it. When you find an auditory image or a visual image, look for other related imagery, uh, images rather. Uh, the sounds of logging and lumber cutting, for instance, we can also see that and smell that. We can see the smoke and the splintering of wood from the blast. We can see the shower of sawdust from the blades. We can smell that acrid smell of smoke and the sweet smell of the sawdust in the air. Okay. Sometimes, yeah, truly just uh, imagery is just kind of one dimensional. It's just, just an auditory image or just a visual image. But a lot of times there can be other kinds of images related to that. So don't be afraid to really dive in to what that experience is. All right, let's go ahead and pause the video again, this time to complete part B of the practice activity. This time you're going to be practicing identifying and explaining examples of imagery in the text. When you're done with the practice activity, don't forget to unpause the video to continue the lesson.
Moving on to our third kind of word choice element, we're going to talk about specific word choice devices, which are just those figures and devices that use carefully chosen words and phrases. There are dozens of devices, literary devices, whatever you want to call them, that rely on word choice. Uh, and really, for AP Lang, you just need to know the ones that you're already familiar with. Uh, I like to think of these as the big five, uh, metaphor, simile, personification, overstatement or hyperbole if you want to call it that and understatement metaphor simile and personification are all used to make figurative comparisons a simile is just a stated figurative comparison i know you're often said that it's a figurative comparison that uses like or as but that's not a good definition because similes don't have to just use like or as those are the most common words but there are other words you can use uh, to make similes so think of a simile as just a stated comparison uh, whereas a metaphor is an implied figurative comparison and finally personification is a special kind of metaphor it's implied figurative comparison where the thing is always being compared to a human being by giving it human qualities overstatement and understatement on the other hand those are used to make exaggerations and there we exaggerate oftentimes stylistically uh, in service of some higher truth yeah, overstatement or hyperbole is the over-exaggeration of something, whereas understatement is the under-exaggeration of something. And I should note at this point that devices can often overlap. You can have a metaphor that is making a hyperbolic comparison, okay? And so that's uh, the use of metaphor uh, and hyperbole together, and you just need to decide which is more important there. Is the comparison the more important thing? Is that what the writer's trying to say? Or is the, the overstatement what the writer's trying to get at. You probably wouldn't want to talk about both of them. Uh, pick whichever one was more, uh, more uh, important to the text. All right, here's an example of word choice devices uh, in John Muir's text when he personifies that sequoia in paragraph two uh, as speaking on its own behalf, as pleading for itself, its own cause. Yeah, the comparison here to a human being is very powerful, and it also creates this really vivid and emotionally stirring image as we all kind of imagine this tree as he kind of uh, paints us this picture of walking into town and pleading uh, on its own behalf. Yeah, so what exactly comes to mind when you think about a tree pleading for its life? Yeah, what do we see? What do we feel? Well, I think that right away I feel more dignity for the tree. I think the tree deserves more dignity because we're picturing it behaving like a human being. So we're giving it the dignity of a human being. Yeah, we're also kind of also uh, imagining a member of some oppressed group or society that's been exploited historically. You know, when 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 he kind of paints this picture of a of a tree pleading for its own existence, I can't help but think of like uh, you know African slaves or Native Americans or something like that that America has again historically oppressed and exploited. And Hey, uh, Muir was probably counting on that, right? Because he's writing to an American audience. So in all, this kind of emphasizes the appeals to pity and shame that Muir is trying to, uh, to elicit. All right, let's go ahead and pause the video one more time. This time, complete part C, where you're going to identify and explain some examples of word choice devices in the John Muir text. When you're done with the practice activity, go ahead and unpause the video to continue the lesson. Finally, let's talk about diction. Now, every year in this class, I hesitate to talk about diction because it is one of the most misunderstood uh, terms in language arts. I think the way that they teach you guys diction in the ninth grade is awful. It is oversimplified and it uh, gives you a really wrong understanding of what diction actually is. Uh, talking about diction in a rhetorical analysis is kind of a running joke among us AP graders because we know that as soon as we see a paper that talks about diction, it's going to be some oversimplified analysis where the student just didn't know anything else to talk about. So they just throw some diction out there and it looks terrible. So here is what diction is. Um, diction refers to patterns of word choice 
throughout a portion of a text or throughout a whole text. Diction does not refer to individual choices of words. I'll say that again. Diction does not refer to individual word choice. Uh, diction has to be patterns of word choice. Okay, So it's something that you could talk about if after reading through a text you see uh, some patterns in the um, meaningful words and phrases, uh, imagery and, and word choice devices. If you see some patterns developing in that, then you could talk about the diction that a writer uses. Analyzing diction requires providing evidence of several words, phrases, and or word choice devices to establish that a particular pattern uh, exists within the text. Now, when analyzing diction within a text, you can't just say, you can't just call it diction. You can't just say that the writer uses diction. That is meaningless. That's like saying the writer uses a pattern within their text. No, you have to describe the diction in some way. Uh, here then are some very uh, useful adjectives for describing different types and qualities of diction. Uh, first of all, we have formal versus informal diction high versus low diction, very similar to formal and informal. We have technical diction, which we call jargon. Abstruse diction, which is a diction that is so elevated and so abstract that it, it becomes difficult to understand. Yeah, for a really good uh, example of abstruse diction, uh, read something by Immanuel Kant or by Hume or one of those um, you know, uh, uh, early modern philosophers, their diction is abstruse because they weren't talking to the lay person. They were talking to uh, you know, other philosophers, that sort of thing. Uh, next, we have concrete diction versus abstract diction. Uh, archaic diction, meaning uh, words that uh, aren't in use anymore. Uh, poetic diction, which is a uh, uh, diction that features a lot of uh, figurative uh, language, that sort of thing. Colloquial diction, which is diction that uh, comes from a particular uh, part of the world, uh, something like uh, y'all or fixing to, that is, uh, you know, uh, kind of colloquial to our region. Vulgar diction, vulgar, by the way, does not mean profanity. Vulgar just means really low, uh, un, um, you know, unrefined diction. Uh, and then finally, slang, things like that. Okay. So there's a couple of things we could say about John Muir's diction throughout this text. Um, for one, he uses a lot of poetic diction when describing the plight of the big trees. Uh, now this is when he's describing the plight of the trees in general. When he talks about individual things that he's seen, he uses a different kind of diction, which I'll let you guys to, uh, to discover for yourselves. But when he's talking generally about the plight of the sequoias, he uses phrase like, phrases like, done in the darkness of ignorance and unbelief, in all its godlike majesty, the ax and saw have long been busy. Fires have spread still wider and more lamentable ruin. These lines feel like they were pulled out of a poem um, or at the very least out of a fantasy novel, something like that. So what does all this poetic diction bring to mind when you read it? What does it sound like when we read it? That's what we need to think about when we analyze diction. To me, when I read these phrases and think, uh, you know, of this poetic diction, I think it elevates the conflict at hand here, the issue here. It elevates it from a mere environmental issue to some kind of fantastical ancient war, <laughs> right? It, again, it almost reads like the beginning of a fairy tale or fantasy story. Like when I read a lot of these phrases, I think of uh, like the Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, that sort of thing, which that wasn't around yet in 1900, but they at least had fairy tales. Uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, that's what comes to mind. All right, let's go ahead and pause one more time to complete part D of the practice activity. This time you're going to be doing what you've done before just for patterns of diction within a text. When you're done with this uh, part of the practice activity, don't forget to unpause the video to finish up the lesson. So why are we learning about style and style analysis? Well, style elements can be used to enhance your rhetorical analysis.
Yeah, you can analyze stylistic elements within paragraphs that analyze uh, these broader rhetorical techniques by explaining how these stylistic elements facilitate and or enhance the rhetorical techniques. Yeah, you usually weave stylistic elements into your text evidence, which can make that text evidence just more specific. For instance, if you are writing a paragraph about Muir's appeal to pity for the trees, you could discuss his meaningful word choice describing the harvesting of the trees. You could discuss his metaphors comparing the, the logging and the loggers to various things, and how all of this facilitates and or enhances the emotional appeal that he's going for. Here then is a sample of a paragraph, a rhetorical analysis paragraph that features a lot of style analysis woven in to the rhetorical analysis. Watch how it enhances uh, the, uh, the uh, analysis of this rhetorical technique. Florence Kelly attempts to open her audience's hearts to the plight of the children with appeals to pity. In paragraph three, she uses sensory language to invite her audience to imagine, quote, several thousand little girls working in textile mills all the night through in the deafening noise of the spindles and the looms. The visual and auditory images are intended to help the audience experience for themselves the dangerous factory machinery these children had to work in, cro in close proximity to. She reinforces this imagery with figurative language, referring to the children who deliver loads of finished clothing to people's homes as, quote, little beasts of burden. This metaphor compares child laborers to pack animals like horses and oxen, suggesting that, like these animals, the children are used as tools and are denied the dignities commonly afforded to human beings, such as the right to an education and self-determinism. Kelly's sensory and figurative language help foster a sense of pity for child laborers. As the vast majority of her audience likely come from middle class and wealthy households, since the poor and working class cannot afford to attend these kinds of conferences, few are likely to have ever experienced the misery of sending a child into the workforce. By stirring pity, Kelly can overcome her audience's lack of emotional attachment to the issue which is vital to enlisting her audience's help ending a practice that doesn't affect them directly. So as you can see here, my style analysis was incorporated into my text evidence uh, and, and into my explanation of effects as well. It's kind of hard not to mention the devices again uh, in your explanations of effects. So that is how you work style analysis into your rhetorical analysis. It makes your analysis more specific uh, because you can, talk, you can uh, give specific names to some of the uh, things that the writer's doing. That is it for this lesson. Go ahead and move on now to part E, the final part of the practice activity, where you will practice writing a rhetorical analysis paragraph uh, that incorporates some of the stylistic elements that you studied in this lesson. Once you've finished up writing your paragraph, you are finished with the lesson.